All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. I'm super excited to present everything to you here tonight. Um, I'm going to talk about contracts, which uh, are a very Java-y kind of term, but I'm going to let them sneak into Ruby just a little bit. Um, my name is Thomas. Uh, I have lived here in Portland for like eight years now. Um, I was a Rubyist. Now uh, I only do it in my free time. Uh, I'm a technical director at an agency here in town called Instrument. Um, we do basically marketing work and apps. And I spend a large portion of my day um, code reviewing and writing JavaScript these days. Uh, my main side project is Middleman. Uh, it's a Ruby side project I've been running for about eight years now, and it's really uh, where I get to still um, flex my Ruby muscles and um, try new things out. Uh, it's getting relatively popular in the recent um, past, so that's really great. Uh, and we just finally, after uh, I made the, the classic open source mistake, and I did a two-year rewrite of a project that was perfectly fine uh, when I started it. So. <laughs> Uh, finally got the new version out. It's beautiful. The code is beautiful. No one else knows. I'm the only one who's in there. So uh, I'm very happy with it. And I don't you know, hate fixing bugs in it anymore. Uh, and so that's basically what re led me to um, looking in how to add contracts to Ruby. So contracts are basically uh, a way of adding um, type information to Ruby outside of the language. So you know, in another language, you'd have these things built in. Ruby prefers just to be super loose and um, Hope you, hope you are logging the error at the time at which it happens. Otherwise, it's just going to explode for your user. Um, so this is Ruby typing. Ruby typing is I want to run a method. I'm a really good programmer. So I wrote my docs. I compiled my docs. You can read the HTML version of my docs. Um, but they don't actually do anything. They just say, I'm going to write a method. And if I'm really, really careful inside of my Ruby code, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to like make sure the things that come into my method and come out of my method are what I expect and what the user expects to have back. So in Ruby, you know, basically what you can do is you can use isa and respond to. So you can duct type and hope that uh, the anonymous class or value that's passed in responds to your data that you expect it to. Or you can say, I need it to be a class or a subclass of some specific class. So uh, in this example, like if I was being super defensive, I would say, you know, I, I want to rewrite Ruby's um, uh, even helper, right? So give me an array of numbers. I'm going to first make sure uh, that it is an array by duct typing it to see if it responds to select, because that's what I'm going to use further down. Or I guess I will allow it to be some other kind of data structure if select happens to exist on it. And then I'm going to just use select. And then I'm, I'm going to be super duper careful. And as we loop through the array, I'm going to check every single item in there to make sure that it is a number. Because you know, if, I try to, if I try to do modulo on a string, I'm just going to have an explosion in my code. And it's not going to be very useful. And then I'm just going to be angry with myself. Um, so this is the way I tend, I tend to write code now is, is incredibly defensively. Um, Ruby doesn't have really any way of, an, of a, like uh, hard coding type information around uh, your methods or actually the pieces of data in your app. So you write comments and you hope people follow the rules. And when they have a bug, they have to go find your documentation and hope that it was actually up to date with what um, you expected. Um, Crystal is a newish language, a, a Ruby-inspired language that's compiled that's getting a little bit of popularity now. Uh, it tries to solve a lot of uh, Ruby's problems with concurrency and typing and speed. Uh, but it looks pretty much like Ruby, but it adds into the language the ability to add type information um, to your methods and values. So this is the syntax for Crystal. Uh, when you uh, have a parameter or a parameter list, you can go ahead and say, you know, I expect this array to be an array, and, and it's an array of integers. And then I expect even, um, because I'm selecting only the even items in this array, to return another array, and that is also filled with integers. So this is pretty straightforward. Um, even just like wrapping like Ruby's normal select and something like this will catch a surprising number of bugs, especially um, since I'm writing middleman, I'm writing a, a library and a, and a system for other people to constantly just pour their code into. And the number of times like you, know, you get bug reports like, I tried to pass a regex in instead of a string and it exploded. Why did it explode? And it's like, well, because it was never supported. So um, adding a lot of information and documentation to your code allows you you know, to just pass it off and be like, hey, this is, this is what it accepts. This is what I expect. And you can really like, lock it down. So I'm not going to switch to Crystal. That's a lot of work. Um, and it's pretty beta. And I'm not going to switch to Go or to Rust, because that's, that's tons of work. 
and I like writing Ruby. Uh, so I went shopping around as I was rewriting Middleman, and I wanted to find a way to do a massive rewrite of this pretty large code base with a large number of users. And I wanted to find a way to do that safely. So I already have tests. I already have you know, 20,000 odd like cucumber things. It's a, it's a horrible mess of integration tests that have been submitted via pull requests for eight years. Um, but most of them pass, and they're mostly, I just take a project when someone submits a bug, I'm like, cool, toss that in the fixture directory, now we have a test that passes forever. Um, but there's not like a lot of logic to it. So I want to be able to write everything, and I want it to look the same coming out as a win in. So my first step was um, to try to find a way to make sure my API remained consistent. That led me to a project um, that was not terribly heavily used at the time called Contracts. So Contracts gives you a DSL for writing, for wrapping methods and values in Ruby uh, in basically pre and post checks. It's really, really simple. Um, it does a little meta programming. It grabs the method, tosses it in a closure, and then runs a, just an array of uh, checks at the beginning and it checks on the return value at the end. Uh, and so what I did with this is before I started rewriting anything, I pulled this library in, I went through all my methods, and I tried to figure out what the hell I actually expected them to do. So with, without even rewriting, I went through and uh, added this type information through contracts to every single thing in the system. Then when I started my rewrite, I was able to move things around, refactor, change everything, rip out the guts. As long as the public API still conforms to uh, what I know I said it would do in the previous safe, stable version, then I can completely you know, do anything to the code that I want to do. So yeah, so this is contract. This is pretty much the only thing uh, that I've seen so far in Ruby that lets you do this. Uh, yeah, I, I do a lot of JavaScript in my day to day, and everyone's hot on preprocessors, but that's not really in the Ruby world. So if you want to write or um, manipulate your data structures and, and methods in Ruby, you've got to do it with metaprogramming. So yeah, this is Ruby code. You can execute the contract method. Um, and basically, I'll, I'm going to walk through the different types of types and groups and uh, um, types of data and the structure of this contract method. So contracts Ruby on their GitHub page, uh, these, are, these are their stated goals for the project. So they want to be able to catch simple bugs such as passing in the wrong thing or accidentally passing nil. This will cover all of your horrible nil uh, issues uh, immediately. So if you run, are running TDD, these contracts will run as soon as anything changes and then you will, you will get information that you call the method wrong very quickly. Um, they also provide informative error messages to your user code from, like, from another library. So again, with middleman, people are doing all kinds of metaprogramming on top of what I've already built because Ruby is incredibly permissive and lets them do whatever they want. Um, and so contracts will kind of lock that down a little bit. So if someone tries to mess with my methods, it'll be like, hey, like, you can't do this. Or if you're going to do this, this is the you know, method structure you have to align with. Uh, and finally, it makes documentation first class. Um, a lot of people, you know, they want to like be pithy and kind of say like, oh, you know, I don't need to write documentation because my code is self-explanatory. That's nonsense, of course. Um, <laughs> this actually, you know, that makes sense when you're like writing English. I put a comment above my if statement and it says it's what it's going to do. Like probably, it probably does. Um, with type information in, in like a, like a yard doc string at the top of a method or, or a value, that stuff goes out of date so quickly. Um, and so what contract lets you do is just take that information out of the comment, put it in the code, and actually run tests against it. So contracts basically takes a whole class of things that would be really incredibly simple, like specs. Just basically, hey man, I called the method, gave it an int, expected an int. Like that's, that's so many um, just like basic tests. And this pulls it out of your actual text infrastructure and puts it right next to the code that it's running against. This is a super simple library to use. Uh, you can just depend on it uh, in your library or in your gym. Uh, if you're not using Bundler, go ahead and just require the thing. And then it creates a top level contract uh, and contracts uh, module. So contracts is a namespace. Um, the documentation recommends that you mix it in to things you're going to use. You don't have to. You can just namespace every single time you interact with contracts with the contracts namespace, but it gets a little uh, verbose. So once it's mixed into a module um, or a class, you can mix it into the root if you're just doing like straight up code on the, the root object. Um, 
you have access to the contract method uh, inside of this scope. And the contract method, you can put it on um, things that generate methods and also things that are methods. So I can go ahead and say, I'm going to do an adder reader on an instance variable called hello. And I will guarantee that no matter what, that's going to be a string. Uh, if someone comes here and that value is nil, contracts will just completely explode, give me a nice line error number, and I can go in and fix that. So this is kind of what it looks like. Um, it's using, it's exploiting some syntax of Ruby to make it all um, uh, parsable code, I, like theoretically, I guess. <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure exactly what it is. I think like there would actually be parens around uh, the nums on this last one, and maybe that last thing is a block. I don't know how exactly they get Ruby to parse that that type information, but it's it's pretty magic. Cool. Uh, so here's how it works. So for each parameter that you have on a method and you want to type, you just define the type name above it. So these are the basic Ruby class names that you use. So this is string, fixed num, bool. Um, it can be your class. It can be an instance of your class. It can be an active record object. Um, anything that is basically triple equals, uh, or double equals, sorry, too much JavaScript, um, is double equals to your value, we'll, we'll evaluate here. And then after the hash rocket, it's the return value of the method. So I have this simple adder method. I'm saying add a number, oops, add a number to a number, get a number. Um, if anything goes wrong here, I, I will know very quickly. That's the basic form. Uh, there's a couple of, of pseudo type classes, like num handles float and fix num, and a bunch, it like unifies a bunch of those types. But for the most part, uh, these are going to look exactly like what you would write in like a here doc string or a, a yard doc string. So there's a couple of helpers in here that let you um, flesh out your uh, type definitions a little more fully. First one is or. Uh, this is usually a sign of maybe a little weak API design, but if you need to have a method that can take a variety of types on the way in, uh, the way they do this is they, again, are just really abusing uh, Ruby syntax. So there's this comparison object called or, and it has an index lookup that just happens to take multiple items. Uh, and that's the syntax that allows you to say, I'm going to write this stringify method, and it's going to take a, sing, a, uh, sorry, a string, a symbol, or a number, and it'll turn into a string. Uh, if I pass in a bool, it'll completely explode. Or if I pass in a nil, it'll explode. Uh, next, there's a concept call of maybe. This all, this is, this is very Haskell. So, if you haven't gone down like the type root like rabbit hole, um, just <laughs> run away the other direction. It's I I could I don't I couldn't talk for an hour on it because I don't understand it. Um, I just know that this works for me. So maybe, maybe is a thing that can be nil. So if, if by default everything in the system you're saying it'll never be a nil object, which is great because that catches so many like issues when you're passing nil as a parameter. Somewhere in the system, it got zeroed out, or somewhere you know it got run out of order, and you don't have a, a access to that value. So this will catch most of your nil access errors immediately. But if you really need it, um, and it's okay with the API, then you can use a maybe. So this is just a reimplementation of uh, string index lookup in Ruby, with some type information added to it. So I'm saying, you know, give me a string and give me the index of the character you want to look up. And maybe I will find it in there. Um, it could be negative one. It could be a million. Like, uh, this is the way the actual Ruby API works. So you either get um, a number that represents, or sorry, this is actually wrong. It should be maybe string. Uh, you get the string that was at the character, or you get a nil object. Is there a difference between or, nil, num, and maybe num? Uh, maybe is an alias for or nil internally. So. It's basically, yeah, or num nil, um, or nil class. Again, this is just to, so they can speak the same verbiage as the Haskell community. Uh, in, in, like, in uh, Swift, it's called optional. It's like you're just constantly like optional, optional, which maybe is a little better, better word. Um, this is still Ruby, so they'll still let us duct type. Uh, so there's a type uh, class called respond to. And so you can basically say, you know, you can take your code that was like heavily relying on this kind of polymorphic uh, duct typing, and you can say, that's cool. I'm just going to type it because I want to be consistent, and maybe I'll come back and I'll refactor this uh, maybe into a better type check later. So the respond to matcher, you just pass it the symbol. It's literally just going to call respond to on the value on the way in to make sure it passes. Uh, 
Um, next is array of. There's a whole class of these. There's actually array of, set of, collection of. Um, and there's some. There's a hash of as well. So again, this lets you say, you know, everything that comes into this first parameter is going to be. It's going to be an array, and every single damn thing there is going to be num. Uh, not going to be any nils in there, not going to be any strings. Like, we're, we're locked down here. So we can safely do things like call modulo uh, without having to worry about whether someone slipped bad data in. And this works definitely for uh, return value as well as a parameter. Uh, you can do some pretty cool things with the typing of hashes. Uh, so you can take something pretty common. Um, Pattern is having an object or an options or an ops uh, hash pass into a method. It could be anything. Like people uh, in middleman, a lot of things are set up like this, and it's super easy to typo uh, the keys for your options and just not even you know know that you've made a mistake. And, and it doesn't throw an error in Ruby. It just doesn't apply because you're looking at the wrong key because it's a typo. So uh, with contracts, you can define all the possible options of your options object or hash uh, and Anything outside of that will throw an error. So if I called make person here with something that wasn't a first name that was a string and a last name that was a string, it would explode. If I typo either of those or I emit either of those, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause problems. Um, if I want to make those optional, I just wrap it in a maybe, and everything's fine again. But this, this, this allows you to encode, define some pretty like fiddly, complex bits of um, your API design. And they have one, there's, a, there's a ton of these things, but these are the basics that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the last one is pattern matching, which is uh, maybe too much magic. <laughs> it's weird saying that in Ruby, but maybe too much magic. Uh, what it basically does, it allows you to write the same method definition over and over again, and basically use contracts as a guard clause uh, to decide which one of these methods is dispatched on based on the incoming parameters. So. I haven't shown this before, but you can actually use concrete values like one as your type. Um, or you can, you know, uh, string, like a specific string. Or you can say, I have an option, and the values are three specific symbols, are like the three keys that can be passed to my option. So you can use concrete values. Uh, and so what pattern matching is doing here, it's basically just like traditional factorial function. It's basically saying, if the x that comes in is a one, it'll always be a one, so run this version. And if it's not the number one, then go ahead and run the more complex recursive version below. Uh, this is, you know, if you end up like a really like top level switch statement or, um, you know, a lot of if guard clauses at the top, then, you know, you can get a lot of it out of the way. I, 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 I'm not sold on this yet, but um, it's kind of it's kind of cool looking. Cool. So that's basically the core API for contracts. Uh, so when I was re writing Middleman 4.0, I went through and did everything. So I just checked it today. Um, there's something like 400 methods that are type checked now, and it's it's pretty amazing. And it's actually it was really trivial because you know it's a public project people use, so the the documentation strings were already there. So converting them to uh, the code version was was not a problem at all. Uh, surprising thing was I found like 30 bugs inside of my own code like on the first night. I was two stringing things. I was you know double checking if things were nil all over the place. Um, I was you know saying is it a path? Is it a string? Is it a symbol? Like all this kind of like additional logical code to cover my ass from myself because I was the only person calling this method. I don't know why I was being so defensive with myself. Um, so like. You know, if, if this is something that interests you, you know, it's not a lot of overhead to jump in and like pick one class or pick, you know, if you got your libs directory going, just go in there. That's a perfect place to add all these uh, contracts <laughs> tests. In fact, don't ever leave your libs directory. Write a, write a gem like Middleman. That's the only directory I have. It's, it's, it's a nice place. Um, yeah, so, you know, this is something I also do. You know, I write, I write JavaScript in my day to day. We've switched entirely to TypeScript um, for the exact same reason on the front end. It's just, the number of times you realize that you have stopped yourself from writing a future nail bug is, is it makes you feel really good inside, and you can go take a coffee break or something. Um, so Middleman Four came out just over the holidays. I found I got some time to work on it uh, after two years of beta. Don't do that. Um, but no real bug reports of any volume, which is, means the API must have actually remained stable between the two versions. Um, and then, because I was feeling adventurous, I put out Middleman 4.1 here, like right here, like five minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and
And uh, I turned on contracts for the entire ecosystem. So previously, it was only run by the test suite for middleman. Uh, as of today, when you write code against middleman, it will tell you right then and there when you've, when you've messed up the whole thing. Um, we'll see tomorrow morning if that turns out to have been a good decision. <laughs> but I don't know. I, mean, I might just take a long coffee break tomorrow and not check GitHub. Uh, cool. Uh, and then I have just a really, really super simple demo. I don't know if I'm paired correctly for it. Also, I never started the screen recording, so go me. <laughs> uh, okay. So, yeah, here's an example of, of middleman. Um, it's a thing. It's like Jekyll, but way better. Um, that's not a joke. It's way better. <laughs> it's actually maintained. Um, cool. Don't record that. Uh, <laughs> all right, so it's a static site generator. You put a bunch of HTML and ERB files in like CoffeeScript. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, do the thing. Him biggin. All right, so yeah, so you, you, know, have, you have input HTML and CSS and SAS and all your, your normal things. Um, you run middleman build on it. Runs it, it builds it, it's Jekyll, it's better. Um, if I say it enough, people will believe. <laughs> All right, so basically, now that everything's typed uh, in my middleman code, I have this thing called proxy. It allows you to alias um, different templates with different incoming values to them. So in this case, I'm saying uh, I have a page called world. It's in here, you can see it when it builds. It was basically just the hello page, but with some slightly different um, instance variables available to it. Uh, you would never do this, but I couldn't think of a, a clever enough demo. So I'm going to try to pass a symbol in instead of a string and see just how badly it explodes. Very badly. All right. So this is the built-in contracts error messaging. Hopefully everyone can see that. So anywhere in your code that a contract has failed, uh, you get some really good stuff. You get a line number. You get the original um, contract that was specified for the method as it was called. And then you get uh, what was expected as a type. So a string was expected on the way in, and then the value that was passed in. So again, 95% of the time, this is just going to say expected to something, and it was nil. But um, this gives you the direct line number. And it helps me when people file bugs uh, against middleman, because I can say, oh, proxy is 25. That, that contract is out of date. So as of 4.1, like if you have a helper method in your config, you could just use contracts yep. without requiring anything? Yeah, it is in the global namespace. So if you in, in, uh, include it into your class or module, it's right there. Um, you can, I don't know if I put it in here, uh, you can run contracts false as an environmental variable to turn it back on. There is, let's see, move that to my actual slide deck. <laughs> All right, here it is. Uh, yes, there's a performance impact for metaprogramming around every single method and value in your entire system. Uh, <laughs> it is surprisingly negligible. And it's one of those things where if you want to be super nerdy about it, you can go and you can profile it. And it'll be you know, 100 milliseconds longer in your execution time. And that's a factor of whatever. But um, the, <laughs> the amount of like real, literal human time and hate and energy that you are saving yourself by just you know, having this thing run take uh, slightly more time to build your site, uh, is gonna, you're going to feel so much better. You can go have coffee or you know, get, a, get a cookie or something. Um, it'll be fine. I wouldn't run this in like a high volume you know, uh, you know, rail site that's not cached. <laughs> you're, but uh, for middleman, it's great. It, the actual, by type, even by typing every single thing in the system, you can't really see it. Um, but if it bothers you, you can turn it off. This is part of the um, contract library itself that environment, er, eh, environmental variable is defined. So any system that any um, tool that uses that and depends on that, you can turn them off globally. And that's it. Hit it. Did you use this for internal components or just for the API pieces of, of middleman? And would you recommend it for the internal things? Like, I think it makes a lot of sense to use for external pieces to sort of explain and mm -hmm. go along with the documentation to sort of make your documentation not be a lie anymore. Yeah. Um, totally. Uh, yeah. Internal things like 
Cool. Uh, yeah, so the question is basically whether uh, I've used this internally for public or private API stuff or just public API stuff uh, within middleman. Uh, you know, there's really no reason not to do both. Uh, again, with Ruby, uh, you, your private API may not be as private as you think it is. Um, I, I just I stopped using the private keyword years ago. It's just it just made me angry. It's like is it private? Is protected? I don't know. I got to keep moving this thing up and down through the file. Um, I don't do it anymore. So everything's re readable by me because maybe I'll want it somewhere else at some point in time. So the actual like effort, I think I did it in an evening. I just you know threw on some shitty Netflix show and and updated all my types in the course of a couple hours. Is there any uh, coverage for like creating your own? Types. Yes. All right. So the question is, yeah, can you go outside of um, the basics and provide your own uh, type definitions and matchers and stuff like that? Uh, it's pretty. It's pretty. It looks pretty simple. Um, the things you are matching against are just values because it's all Ruby. And it's not like another post processing step. So if I want to do something that, um, you know, I want to say like my thing is, let me blow this up. You know, I don't know. I have a name. This is just code. I can put this anywhere. Um, name is a string or a symbol. Then I can I can store that somewhere. I can require it. I can have a con I can have a whole file filled with all of my specific um, uh, named uh, string look or uh, type lookups. Um, so you can do that. You can you know pass in person. You can have um, you know any kind of value that can be checked. Additionally, you can write your own. Uh, matchers. Let's see if my internet's working. So I have a few of these in middleman. I have like these pretty complex data structures that are, like it has to be in some order. So I have a type thing that's like not only does it have to be a thing, it has to be in an order. It has to be a, a short a sh number of items. Um, let's see. So uh, I didn't touch on invariants, but invariants are pretty rad because you can just say. Um, like not, you, it's basically a super guard clause. It's like a runtime guard clause that says, you know, you, I, I'm going to say I want a string, but maybe like a string in like Japanese is still not going to break my system. So you can add additional checks to the types uh, pretty straight, in a pretty straightforward way. But let's see, it's in here somewhere. So yeah, so basically what you can do is you can pass a proc as um, a validator. It just takes a value on the way in and returns whether or not it explodes. Or um, so any class which has a public valid method can be used to check against. So instead, you would replace or with this. So if you want to say like you know is super special, you can just define it as um, a really simple class that takes a value and then calls valid on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so the statement was basically like this is something that seems like it would, you know, there'd be no downsides to running in a dev environment, whereas there may be some side effects in production. Um, that's totally true. That's what I did for Middleman for about a year and a half. Uh, and then I just started getting bug reports that would have been solved by a nice error message that I shouldn't have to custom check and custom write the error message for every user. Uh, so we'll see if turning that on outside of the dev environment was a good idea, but I think it'll pay dividends. Middle back. Could you have multiple um, on, the, on the same method? Uh, on the method, or for example, in the maybe class, you could check the boundary, right? Boundaries of the array. You. Put that in as well in the contract? Uh, you mean so, like, uh, deal with the actual specific value? Or check the boundary conditions of an array. array. Mm hmm. Yeah, so the question was uh, whether you could write, um, like, logic checks in the type definition. Uh, you can't, but you can write a custom checker, basically. So you could have, you know, my bounding thing. Live coding. It's going to be super simple. Done. We're done. No crashes. Here. Uh, but basically, yeah, so you would write, you could write your own custom checker for your business logic here. Um, yeah. But you can't, you could not stack, or you could not, you know, it's, it's going to be executed when the class is parsed. So it won't have the context of um, the actual value that's being passed in every time when it's first set up. So 
Yeah, I, I will often um, build up a library of these like very specific things. Sometimes it does make sense just to do it in code in your method body. Like maybe you need to fail grace. Like this is going to be a hard fail, and you're not going to be wanting to catch these exceptions and recover. This is like someone passed something crazy. I'm going to explode. At least let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you still, you know, you, there's still a great place in your class to handle errors or recover from them. In the back. Um, how does the type checking on classes deal with inheritance hierarchy? It does the, um, it works with, it uses isa, so it goes up the tree, basically. So if you have a parent class and you are type checking against the parent class, then it'll correctly uh, refer them. Mm -hmm. an output, but then also wrap that into your error messages. Can I'm, you, like, modify the yeah. all return values to wrap them and stuff? Yeah, so the question is whether you can modify the default uh, error messaging that comes out. Uh, I am pretty sure I saw that in their docs somewhere, but again, it's just Ruby, so just take their function and you know, put your own there. Yeah. Like, whatever. <laughs> 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 all right, way back. Yeah. So do you actually integrate those with another documentation tool? Is it the usual documentation? Are you throwing those away anyway? Yeah, great question. Uh, so the question was basically whether this integrates with existing documentation tools. Uh, if you're replacing your Yardocs stuff uh, with contracts, one would hopefully uh, compile to the same 